The year was 1851. The Pony Express was about a decade away from being established. Two men, George and Absalom, were hired for $14,000 a year to deliver the mail from the west to the eastern states. This route began in Sacramento, went through the Sierra Mountains, and then up to the Great Salt Lake, and then onward to the east coast. This route was done by packing mules, and it took a very long time, 16 days, just to reach Salt Lake over in Utah. It also proved very dangerous. Absalom was killed by Indians, and though George was intent on continuing on, the snow blizzards were simply too, de too much and too dangerous. Soon the route to the east switched to going south and along the bottom of the states over to the east coast. This meant that mail would not need to pass through the Sierra during the winter at all. Those living in and around South Lake Tahoe would just simply be cut off from all communication. This, of course, was not a good thing. Imagine being isolated for up to six months out of the year, not being able to hear what was going on in the world, not being able to tell a family member that a loved one had died. Not just letters were sent. Medicine sometimes was only available in the cities. And what if you needed some or you'd surely die? Well, hopefully you were fine for at least six months because uh, you wouldn't get it in the mail. And this brings us to the topic of today's episode. In 1855, the Sacramento Union newspaper wrote, People lost to the world. Uncle Sam needs a mail carrier. The guy who applied right away was a guy named John Thompson. He was about 28 years old, 6 feet tall, and 180 pounds from Norway. So, imagine a guy that kind of looks like a Viking. In this episode of Ricky's Historical Tidbits, I will tell you the life story of a man that is known today as Snowshoe Thompson. This is Ricky's Historical Tidbits Podcast, and this is Ricky Mortensen. John Torsteinson came to the United States at 10 years old, changed his name to the American spelling of John, and the family changed their last name from Torsteinson to Thompson to be more American. His family settled on a farm in Illinois and then moved on to Missouri and then to Iowa. John moved on to Wisconsin himself, where he caught gold fever and took an opportunity to move a herd of milk cows to California. He dropped everything to become a rich and successful miner in Flasserville. But of course, very few made it rich. He mined at Kelsey Diggins and then went to Coon Hollow and then to Georgetown before deciding the minor life was not all that it's cracked up to be and took what he had and bought a plot of land over at Puda Creek in the Sacramento Valley. Up to this point in time, all attempts to deliver the mail were by snowshoe as we know them today. Just as you would imagine, uh, woven snowshoes typically made by Native Americans. Imagine trying to walk from Placerville to Carson City. That'd be insane! But there was no other way. But John knew another way. Back in Norway when he was just a kid, he remembered flying around in the snow on these snowshoes, Norwegian snowshoes. But they weren't like what you call snowshoes today. He used his memory and grabbed a slab of oak wood and carved out two 10-foot-long, um, 4-inch-wide, 25-pound planks and then added a leather strap for his shoes and then grabbed a 6-foot-long pole for steering and propelling. Sounds like skis, right? Pretty much. Back in Norway, they were just called snowshoes. So Thompson, when asked what his invention was, he just said snowshoe. So in January of 1856, John Thompson started his mail route. A huge crowd gathered as he embarked on his journey. One spectator yelled out, Good luck, snowshoe! On this trip, he traveled from Placerville around South Lake Tahoe up to Carson City and then back, delivering the mail and picking up new mail to be sent back west. It took three days to make it to Carson City and two days to make it back. Doing this in the winter two to four times a month, depending on the demand. So how did he sleep on the way down? He carried no blankets, no tent. All he carried was the mail, some food, some matches, and the Bible. So whenever he needed a rest, he would find a cave or build some sort of shelter or find an abandoned cabin to hide out in. But sometimes he got caught in a blizzard. In the Sierra, snow can pile on extremely fast. Snow can get up to 27 feet thick in about a 24-hour period of time. Three feet of snow could pile on. 
During the times he would get caught in a blizzard, he didn't sleep. He just found a rock and danced the Norwegian folk dance until the blizzard passed. The average route he made was about 90 miles long. Winds during blizzards could get up to 80 miles an hour, and snowdrifts could be about 50 feet. Snowshoe Thompson, as he became known as, didn't wear the typical clothes we would wear today if we went skiing. He simply wore a thick flannel jacket, a wide-rimmed hat, pants, and boots. To keep from going snow blind, he rubbed charcoal under his eyes like a football player. The food he took with him was simple survival food. Dried sausage, beef jerky, crackers, and biscuits. And pretty soon, he proved himself to be quite the mailman and quickly became sort of a celebrity, which he liked a lot. He loved to help out his community and took his job very seriously. He always left at the same time for his route so that the people that would be expecting the mail knew when he would be coming down. One story mentioned that people would leave their homes and look up at Genoa Peak to watch the Viking mailman fly down the mountain. The postmaster of Genoa said this, most remarkable man I ever knew, that snowshoe Thompson. He must be made of iron. Besides, he never thinks of himself, but he'd give every last breath for anyone else, even a total stranger. There are at least two specific stories about him saving people. The first is an account of one man to the newspaper about his encounter. He and two other men were on their way to a mine when they got snuck in a snowstorm. Somehow, word got out and Snowshoe was sent to the rescue. We were half frozen when Snowshoe found us. We drew straws with chattering teeth to see who would go back first. I've covered ground in many good ways, from an elephant's back in India, a uh, Jakrishka in Japan, to the fastest coach and eight horses in California. But the ride on the back of those snowshoes was the most exciting one of my life. Old Snowshoe Thompson didn't stop to say, look out for the corners. And hanging on for dear life, we went sliding down the mountain. Snowshoe made the three trips one after another without a complaint. Although that was a terrible hardship, even for a man as accustomed to the snow-covered mountains of Snowshoe. The other is this. Around Christmas one year, a fur trapper named James Sisson was hunkering down in an abandoned cabin. His feet were pretty much a goner, half frozen. He hadn't eaten for 12 days, and there was no way of making a fire that whole time either. And it wasn't just the feet that were on the verge of dying. Luckily for him, Snowshoe Thompson showed up at the cabin to rest himself, and he found Sisson. Though he was tired, he quickly made a fire and booked it as fast as he could to the town of Genoa, where he got a rescue team. By the way, if you don't know where Genoa is, it's about halfway between South Lake Tahoe and Carson City. He carved snowshoes for the men, gave them a quick lesson on how to ski, and then they made haste back to the cabin where they took Sisson back to Genoa to the doctor. Now, the doctor had nothing but bad news. Sisson's feet had to be amputated, but he was all out of chloroform. So Snowshoe once again booked it from Genoa all the way back to Placerville just to find out that there was no chloroform there either. So he had to continue all the way to Sacramento where he got some and made his way back to Genoa. It took a whole 10 days to make that crazy trip, about 400 miles. And because of that, Mr. Sisson lived. Mail was not just letters. Thompson's mail sack would be about 100 pounds. Some of the other kinds of things he would carry were medicine, emergency supplies, clothes, books, tools, pots, pans. Sometimes it was mail-ordered items like a glass chimney for a lamp or uh, maybe a fiddler needed new strings for his fiddle. Snowshoe would bring him some strings. And of course, he brought the newspaper around with him too. Eventually, in 1859, Snowshoe innovated, and with the help of a judge from Genoa, started a sleigh line across the Sierra. Horses would wear these special snowshoes that Snowshoe Thompson made, that way bigger packages and even people could cross the mountains safely, even in the winter, but not in a blizzard or a really bad weather. That same year, he was asked to bring this weird-looking blue rock, well, it's kind of blue, uh, from the Virginia City area to Sacramento to have it assayed which means to have it checked out. And it turned out to be full of silver. By this time, the gold rush had slowed down to molasses, and the discovery called the Comstock Lode in Virginia City sparked the silver stampede. Now, Snowshoe Thompson 
was a servant. When his community needed him, he always said yes. And this brings me to where Snowshoe Thompson almost died. Quick lesson. Rangers are basically militiamen uh, who would form when needed, kind of like today's National Guard. And as you can imagine, sometimes Native American tribes and American settlers had their problems. In 1860, there was some kind of issue that ended with the deaths of a few American settlers. So a militia group comprising of three separate militia groups was sent out to confront the tribe responsible. This militia was described as a, quote, Motley Company mustered from the mining towns and settlements in the valley, poorly mounted and armed, with wretched muskets and shotguns. The group was a heterogeneous mixture of independent elements, poorly armed, without discipline, and that they did not believe the Indians would fight. Snowshoe Thompson answered the call for help and joined the Genoa Rangers. This group was a mixture of the Silver City Guards, the Carson City Rangers, and the Genoa Rangers, totaling up about 105 men headed by Mr. Ormsby. Well, as they made their way to Pyramid Lake to confront the Paiute tribe, they were ambushed at a place called Williams Station. Williams Station is where the Lahotan uh, Reservoir is today. It was a Pony Express stop. Originally, the idea of going to Pyramid Lake was to make peace. But after this attack, peace was not really an option. Again, these guys were not trained, just militiamen. When they got closer to Pyramid Lake, they saw some Paiute on horses up on a hill. One guy, acting on his own, decided to fire and kill one of them. And this didn't help one bit. As the militia group got into the valley, they saw another couple of Paiute on horses up on a hill, looking down on them. And out of nowhere, a ton of Paiutes surrounded the militia and began shooting both arrows and bullets at them. They overpowered the militia extremely fast. This battle only lasted a few minutes. And in the midst of the smoke and screams, Ormsby yelled out, Retreat! The quickest way out of this valley was up a somewhat steep hill. And as they ran straight toward it, more Paiute were waiting on top of the hill. Oddly enough, Ormsby was a friend of the tribe. He'd actually taught many of them to uh, read, write, and speak in English. At one point, Ormsby, as he was trying to flee up the hill, was flung off his horse and rolled down the hill. And though blood was dripping down his face, he saw a familiar face he knew and called out his name. But at that moment, another Paiute warrior straddled above Ormsby, got his bow ready, and simply said, It's too late for talk then released his arrow, killing Armsby immediately. Snowshoe Thompson, though, was able to escape, and he got over to the Truckee River on foot. Finally resting, he felt a hot breath on his neck. He expected a hand-to-hand -hand battle, so he turned around real quick, ready to fight, and lo and behold, it was a horse, saddled up and ready to go. He quickly got on and made it home safely. Thompson said that that horse was sent by God, no doubt about it. Out of the 105 men who went in this endeavor, only 29 came back. After this, the California Rangers were sent in, and after about two battles, the Paiute War Chief Winnemucca eventually surrendered, signing a treaty, and then stayed on the reservation after that. The result of this was Nevada Territory being created. Before this, it was just Utah Territory. Snowshoe Thompson was very happy to get back to a normal life, and soon he met a lady named Agnes, who he then eventually married in 1866. Thompson, until then, had just been a single homesteader, but after getting married, settled over in Diamond Valley in Alpine County. They raised cattle, boarded horses, grew wheat, oats, hay, potatoes, gooseberries, and currants. But every winter, Two to four times a month, he would make it the rounds delivering the mail, but he wasn't all work and no play. Snowshoe absolutely loved playing in the snow. He built snowshoes for everyone that wanted some, and he even gave lessons on how to snowshoe as well. He went around doing big jumps, racing down hills, and doing a few tricks. And soon, snowshoeing, which we call skiing today, was a big hit. After Snowshoe Thompson had his son Arthur, he went to the postmaster and asked for his money. For all the years he had been delivering the mail, he never got paid. 
He figured he'd get paid eventually, but now with a kid, he wanted his money. They told him that they would get it to him, but the weeks went by, and they simply kept telling him that they were waiting for money from Washington, D.C. Eventually, the Nevada legislature in 1869 appealed to the federal government to give Snowshoe $6,000. Nothing came of it. So in 1872, Snowshoe got on a train and headed to D.C. The train he was on got stuck in the snow, and after a few hours, Snowshoe got irritated and began walking with his briefcase. After three days of walking, he got to Wyoming, where he got on another train, which then got him to D.C. Apparently, this trip was historic in and of itself, because he made the fastest trip until then from the Pacific to the Atlantic, which was about two weeks. He was in D.C. for about six weeks lobbying for payment, but nothing came out of it. He actually ended up running out of his own money and went back home even more empty-handed. You'd think he would be bitter and angry after this, but he only blamed himself for not signing any paperwork. Until then, he would always say that if he did his job, well, Uncle Sam would pay him. But it was evident that that would never happen. When he got back to California, he thought about just quitting, now knowing he would never get paid for this grueling and dangerous work. Snowshoe started asking people for payment of $1 per piece of mail, but it didn't work out. The people didn't understand, or maybe they just didn't care. They refused to pay, but still expected their mail to be delivered. Maybe someone else would have taken up the torch if he had quit. We'll never know, because he just continued on. As I said before, the man just wanted to be a help to the community, and uh, the celebrity status was pretty cool too. At the young age of 49 years old, Snowshoe got appendicitis, which turned into pneumonia, and he died. His son, Arthur, died two years later, at 11 years old, from diphtheria. Statues of him can be found all across California and Nevada. There's even one of him back in Norway as well. The Placerville Fountain and Tallman Museum has one of the pairs of snowshoes he used on display along with all kinds of cool things about him. Plus, Snowshoe Thompson is featured in the Myers on Main scavenger hunt on Main Street over in Placerville. That's it for this episode. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. In 1855 in Old California, a man was looking in the paper one day Uncle Sam needs a postman to carry the mail Through the high Sierra mountains over godforsaken trails the Snowshoe Thompson told him he swore he was the man I'll get through them mountains if anybody can He took a pair of snowshoes, he took a pair of skis And lit out through the mountains where a normal man would freeze He was cautious as a mountain cat, fleet as as a deer, tough as a grizzly bear, he knew no fear. He lived a life of danger, bringing mountain people news. Cause snowshoe Thompson packed the mail on through. In the high Sierra mountains, it was 32 below. Blue blizzards fairly whistled, bringing 40 feet of snow. No one dared to venture on the slippery mountain trails. But Snowshoe kept a coming, he was packing U.S. mail. His face was weather beaten from his many rugged miles. But he knew it was worth it when he'd see the people smile. His deeds are not forgotten, listed in the Hall of Fame. They change in Old Squaw Valley to Snowshoe Thompson's name. He was cautious as a mountain cat, fleet as a deer, tough as a grizzly bear, he knew no fear. He lived a life of danger, bringing mountain people news, cause Snowshoe Thompson packed a mail on through.